Welcome back students. In this video, we're gonna look at resonance patterns, which is finally gonna allow us to come up with our own resonance structures. At the end of the last video, I gave you this problem. I said, let's draw all curved arrows to generate all the resonance structures, including formal charge brackets and double-headed arrows. And we didn't even try it because we weren't ready yet. It's really a lot to do to draw resonance structures. It's not like general chemistry resonance structures. Sometimes we don't even know where to begin, but we can learn where to begin when we start looking at patterns. So before we dive into an example like this, let's actually look at some patterns that we can follow that help simplify the resonance process. Here are five resonance patterns. These five resonance patterns are all different from one another and require kind of like a different set of arrows. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at each pattern individually. Before we can start looking at each pattern individually, we have to put in some vocabulary. Because if you notice that two of the resonance patterns on the right previous page said allylic in them, but what's allylic mean? When we look at these structures, I'm gonna point out the allylic position. The allylic positions are going to be here. It's actually all four of them are allylic. So what does that mean? Well, when you find the pi bond, one carbon away is the allylic position, right? One carbon away is adjacent. So a carbon that's adjacent to a carbon-carbon double bond is allylic. Whereas vinylic is you find the pi bond and the carbon involved in the pi bond are vinylic. So these are allylic, whereas these are vinylic. Now that we know the allylic position, it's time to start looking at those arrow pushing patterns. Here's our first arrow pushing pattern. We're gonna look at allylic lone pairs. Before we actually look at the pattern, let's look at these structures that I've drawn. Once we find the double bonds, in order for us to have an allylic lone pair, we need a lone pair adjacent to that, or one carbon or one atom away. So I'm highlighting my adjacent lone pair or lone pairs in yellow. So here I'm only gonna highlight one of them. Just pick one. Now, some of these might not technically be allylic because of the, the true structure of what allylic means and you know can it be an oxygen that has the lone pair and still be allylic but really I mean who cares what matters is they follow all of the same patterns whether they follow the strict definition of what allylic is you have a pi bond one atom away there's a lone pair and when you have a pi bond and one atom away that's a lone pair you always have the same set of arrows you start your first arrow at the pair of electrons, and this arrow says form pi bond here. This will, of course, mess up your octet for the carbon that I just highlighted, so you need another arrow that says put electron pair here. When I redraw my skeleton, now what I wanna do is put in my pi electrons that have changed location. And if you looked at me and you saw me do change in quotes, right? Because really like we're changing it on paper. Remember in an earlier video, we said there's no flip flopping, right? What we're really doing is we're trying to create a picture on our paper of where the electrons are most of the time. And then we take those resonance structures and we mentally average them. Now let's take that first arrow and draw the pi bond here and the second arrow says lone pair here and this is your pattern for when you have an allylic lone pair let's look at another pattern in this one we're going to start with our carbon carbon double bond again and one atom away there is a carbon that has a positive charge so the allylic portion is the position where the positive charge is. The fact that the positive charge is there and on a carbon is what makes it a carbocation. So the allylic means that we have pi bond one atom away is the allylic position, whereas the carbocation means that we have a carbon 
in that position that has a positive charge on it. When we consider this type of resonance structure, what will happen is your pi bond will end up coming over to the other side where there is an empty space for that pi bond to be. If we didn't have that positive charge here, it wouldn't work. So I'm gonna redraw my skeleton like I did. I'm gonna put my pi bond where I told my arrow to put it. And then I'm gonna have my positive charge here. So this is our your allylic carbocation pattern. Now this example below looks a lot similar, it is the same one, as the first example in the notes. Now that we look at the allylic carbocation, we can start to consider what if we have something that's not a really basic structure? Because here's the problem. When you first start seeing these patterns, I'm trying to not overwhelm you. So I'm giving you the most basic structures that I can come up with. But then when you start doing practice, you're gonna go, hey, these are not that easy, right? It looked so much easier when it was these basic structures. And you really need to kind of focus in on where's the allylic part? The allylic part is pi bond, one carbon away is a positive charge. Let's go ahead and draw an arrow for that. We start at the pi bond and we point at the bond between the carbon that's sp2 hybridized and the carbon that has the positive charge. And we can redraw the skeleton for our next one. So let's do that right now. Here is what did not change. What did change is we have a pair of electrons here now as a bond, and that leaves a lack of electrons right here. Now what I want you to do is look again at the pairs of electrons. I want you to look and see, hey, you know what? There's a pi bond here too. There's a pi bond there, and you know what? One carbon away, there's a positive charge. So that part's allylic as well. Because that part's allylic as well, we can draw another arrow. And when we draw this other arrow, we get another resonance structure. So this is the first time you've seen three resonance structures. Now your question is going to be, how did you know to draw three? How do you know when to stop? How do you know there's not four? Those are really good questions. And I'm going to try to answer it as simply as I can. At the same time, don't get your hopes up. It's you're not going to like my answer. In general, this is what you do. You make sure that you know how to use resonance arrows. You make sure you're not drawing any wrong arrows. And then you draw arrows using the patterns until you can no longer draw a new resonance structure. For example, if I were to look at the structure that I drew here at the end and say, hey, you know what? I have an allylic position here. What if I go backward? What if I do this? Well, that just ends up creating a resonance structure that you've already drawn. That means that I don't need to put that arrow there. I don't need another resonance structure. So if you know how to draw arrows, you're not drawing wrong things. You keep drawing resonance structures following the patterns until you start getting to resonance structures you've already drawn, and that's how you know when to stop. Really, it just takes a boatload of practice. Let's look at our other patterns. In this resonance pattern, we have a lone pair adjacent to a positive charge. All right, so a lone pair right next to a positive charge. We've got several lone pairs here, I'm just highlighting one, and we have a carbon that has a positive charge. Over here, a carbon with a positive charge. Next door is a lone pair. More than one, but we just pick one. What happens in this type of pattern is the lone pair swings around and makes a pi bond. The reason it can do that is because you have a carbon with a positive charge. If that carbon was not positive, then this would not be possible. I'm gonna redraw my skeleton. I'm gonna keep my lone pairs here that didn't change. And I'm gonna put in my new pi bond that comes from the lone pair being said to, 
go here, you're going to make a pi bond. In the bottom example, the same type of thing is going to happen. Lone pair comes here, point between the two atoms. When you point between the two atoms, you say make double bond here. And when I draw this, I'm going to leave my lone pair that didn't change on my oxygen, and I'm going to add my double bond. Now remember that I need to be checking my formal charge because I started with my first structure with a positive and I don't have any positive written on my second structure, but that oxygen is surely positive. We have two patterns left. The next pattern is essentially the opposite of the one that we just went through. When you have a pi bond between atoms that have very different electron activity, what can happen is those atoms can take on extra electron density so they can take on that extra pair of electrons. This doesn't really happen with carbon-carbon bonds because, you know, that would be silly. That would be like saying you have a positive carbon and a negative carbon right next to one another, and that's an, that's an ionic thing. Whereas when we're looking at a carbon and an oxygen or a carbon and a nitrogen, well, oxygen and nitrogen are the two of the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table. They can absolutely take on extra electron density. When we redraw this, we're going to have our pairs of electrons that were already there, and we're going to add in the pairs of electron or the pair of electrons where we said this pi bond is forming a lone pair on the oxygen. This creates a negative charge. That negative oxygen should be your clue that you need to look for a positive charge too. You can't forget that this carbon is now positive because it went from having four bonds to three bonds. Because this one was net zero charge over here, this one needs to have a net zero charge. So the overall charge on your resonance structures stays consistent through the entire thing. The same thing is going to happen in this example. Pair of electrons comes over, hangs out on the nitrogen. So we redraw the skeleton. And one pair of electrons was already on the nitrogen, and now we have a new pair of electrons on there. And no, I point, as long as you point the arrow to the nitrogen, it doesn't actually matter you know, where you add that pair of electrons. I bet someone right now is thinking, well, shouldn't she have pointed the arrow to that side of the nitrogen if she's putting the electrons there? I know that organic chemists are picky, but we're not that picky. Now, we're going to put in our formal charge, negative and positive. One pattern left. Let's look at it. This pattern is probably the easiest uh, when you first look at it, but can actually be really difficult. So when we look at conjugated pi systems, which you don't really know what that is yet, but for now, let's say that they are rings that have a double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, and so on. What we have is three arrows. And when we go through this process and we draw the resonance structure, and the structure is called benzene, so we draw the resonance structure for benzene, what's happening is sometimes it looks the same, but it's not the same. The left-hand side is showing single bonds here, here, and here, and the right-hand side is showing single bonds here, here, and here. But you know what? In resonance land, neither of those structures exist. What exists is the resonance hybrid, which is a mixture between them. Uh, but anyway, when we're looking at those conjugated pi systems, the, and you see this resonance pattern, students are like, oh, well, that's, I mean, that's easy. It can't get any harder than that. But it really can because if you look at the example I have down here, where now I have a CH3 group on the outside of the ring that has a positive charge, this one can have a boatload of resonance structures because you essentially have an allylic position where I've highlighted my pi bond in blue and then one carbon away, I have the carbon that's positively charged, and that's like your allylic. And you can just keep drawing resonance structures for that. You want to give it a try? It's kind of tough. Why don't you pause yourself, or pause me, 
and see if you can draw some resonance structures for this. And then I'll come back with some answers. Thanks for giving drawing that a try. I know it's really hard, but I wanted to show you how difficult that these can get. Notice how in mine I have a whole bunch of resonance structures. And one thing that I do want to point out is the first structure that's here and the last structure. Look at those right now and ask yourself, are those the same structure? What do you think? They're not. They're actually two different resonance structures because one's showing the pi bonds in a different location within the benzene ring. This can be really tricky where as we keep going, you might look at that end one and say, oh, but that's the same structure, so I don't need to draw one, right? She told me that I can stop drawing resonance structures once I get to a point where I'm you know, redrawing the same structure again. And you just have to be really careful about how those two are actually two different structures. If you're my student, I don't think the Klein textbook has enough practice for drawing resonance structures, so we have extra practice on our D2L site that I want you to try, and the answer key is already posted. Here is our summary of patterns. Your allylic lone pair does something like this. Lone pair makes a pi bond, pi bond makes a lone pair. Over here, your allylic carbocation does this. You have a hole on one side, the pi bond fills that hole but leaves a hole on the other side. When you have a lone pair adjacent to a positively charged carbon, then you share those electrons. If you have a pi bond between atoms of differing electronegativity, then the more electronegative atom can take on extra electron density. And in your conjugated pi system, you can do something like this. If we start looking at these resonance structures with the context of patterns, they become a lot simpler. They're not easy, and they never will be. They just take a lot of practice. In this video, we distinguished between allylic and vinylic positions so that we could utilize those words when we looked at the five arrow pushing patterns. You want to continue practicing drawing resonance structures and using the arrows to generate resonance structures because it is really hard. It's going to take a lot of time and practice. Make sure that you're including the double-headed arrows between your resonance structures and you're ending everything in brackets. You're going to get to a point where you're going to start asking, how do I know when to stop drawing structures? And you stop drawing structures when you're drawing correct arrows and you are starting to draw the same resonance structure again. That's how you know when it's time to quit. You must master generating resonance structures with curved arrows, right? And remember, when I say generating, if you're my student, those curved arrows are required and part of your resonance structure question grades. So you must include the curved arrows to come up with the resonance structures. Thanks so much for your attention. This is Katoni signing out.